This is Nick Mantucci with WorkOtter, and we're going to go through the global setting configuration, which is the first deliverable for the phase one typical scope for our clients. The global setting configuration is available through the WorkOtter tool, and that is the only place it's available. It can't be set up or configured any other way, so you will have to have an administrator's account to be able to do the things we're going to talk about today. I'm over here now in the WorkOtter environment, and the place where this can be configured is under the gear icon at the top. If you don't see this gear icon and the word admin next to it, that means you're not an administrator and you'll need to either have someone give you access or get someone else who can uh, access this particular area of the tool. So clicking on this gear icon, you'll find a number of administrative settings, um, some of which are configurable outside of this page, some of which are not. The first place we're going to go to today however, is under the system setting, and it's work out our global settings, which is right here. So to access that, you just click on the link, and it brings up a number of different settings that you can choose from. We're going to talk about each of the ones you should change, and many of the ones you should just leave alone, or at least work with your uh, expert that you've been assigned to, uh, the person who's in helping you from the work outer side, to get further clarification. Okay, so uh, going through the project settings, the resource plan setting, we highly recommend you def disable that. That is a deprecated feature in WorkOtter, and it should be disabled when you first set it up. The default forecasting data source, so within every project, the demand can be generated from a variety of places, and this just sets the universe default. My f personal favorite is task else allocation to project. What that means is if there's a plan, a detailed plan, the system will use that plan to build the forecast for that project. If there is no detailed plan, it will then look to see if you've allocated as a percentage of someone's time their participation on a team. So this is my typical favorite option. My second favorite option is just using the team-based forecast where you only have to set a start date, an end date, and a percentage of time. Obviously, if you're not using forecasting or don't plan to initially use forecasting, you can turn it off by default. So I'm going to click task else for this implementation. As far as the default financial tracking type, this should be pretty obvious to you. If you're not tracking financials, please set it to none. If you are tracking financials but you don't actually perform projects for your external customers, leave it on internal budget. If you track a combination of projects, both internal and external, where you want to calculate the profit or loss for those external projects, and those are predominantly what you do, then make the default external profit and loss. Um, we have a number of clients who sync reports to other systems like their ERP. And so another project settings, if you wish to have an additional manually set project ID alongside the one that our Oracle database is going to give you, then you can have that turned on. Uh, this next default managed by is for clients who really use Microsoft Project quite a bit, the integration capabilities, they would set that to be the default when they create a new project. I would say most of our clients are going to stick with NoSync. Now, on the project side, when you create a project, there's a scorecard, a business value assessment, if you will, that you can enter after you've entered the initial project charter type information on the project form. Some of our clients really love this feature and want to be able to score every project. And those clients would set this up or enable it. Others, if you're, or if you're not sure, I would recommend just leaving it disabled. Similarly, there's a scorecard that you can engage in at the end of the project. So you can literally tag people on the project team, usually stakeholders or senior level people, who you want to collect survey information from this project. How well did we perform on this project? And so you can enable that. We recommend leaving it disabled for phase one. That's not typically part of a phase one implementation. This is the, the routing capability in WorkOtter. It allows you to move a project through the life cycle. And so this 
feature says of the security levels one, two, three, or four, what is the minimum security to be able to move a project from one place to another in the visual life cycle? And similarly, what is the minimum security level to be able to add a project, which would then show up in this drop down as a new project capability where you can set it up. As far as admin project settings, these just allow you to make it so only admins can do very specific things. Like maybe uh, in your implementation only admins can create a project or copy a project. These are just different areas where projects can be created and so we want to give you the ability to block those should you need to. We also allow you to enable or disable within a project the Kanban board feature which is very popular and it's actually really very usable so we recommend you enabling it. Now as far as requests or the intake process this is the section where you can set up system areas. We recommend you keeping that disabled. These are again deprecated features. As far as business value, that's up to you. Again, it's another one of the scorecards, the third scorecard, and this is at the very early stages when perhaps an internal client is setting up a new idea, and you want to take them through a scorecard to gather some initial scoring of how important this request is versus others. If you're unsure, I would go ahead and disable it. Similarly, what's the minimum security level to enter a new request? or to route a request through the process. These can be configured here. We again recommend level one if you don't have an idea at this time. These are the reminder feature built into WorkOtter. So when there's an issue, a task, a risk, a deliverable, you can set up a couple reminder emails, up to two. So this supports an integer value and this will email them anything that's incomplete X number of days before it's due. So if you wanted to send someone an email three days before it's due, you would type the number three. The second email can be sent then, if it's still not complete, maybe you set zero, which means the day it's due. You can even set these to negative, like negative one means the day after it's due. So this just allows you to configure a couple reminder emails to your user community. If you leave them blank, that just means no emails will go out. Similarly, we have a timesheet reminder system, or our tattletale reporting, if you will, where you can enable it if this is something you want to take advantage of. Many of our clients have a set schedule when they want to be able to send out timesheet reminders for people who haven't met whatever the standard is for success in your business. So if you enable it, then you can pick the day of the week and the time. So maybe I'm going to set it at 11 a.m. on Mondays. And you can choose some of these other features, like if you want to copy their manager. And then this is just what percentage of their time has to be entered on the timesheet to not get put into the tattletale report. So 100% means if they're supposed to work 40 hours a week in their personal record and they've entered 39 hours they're going to show up on the tattletale report. You can set a lower threshold if you wish. And then this is just the send to. So usually it's like a no reply at your domain.com something like that so that you know it's coming from a trusted source. Okay. Moving along, user-defined help active features. So this is a special capability. It's these little eyes, actually, that show up on the forms. And you can click on them and actually set up your own help notes. We recommend leaving it on and actually filling them in. It's going to be personalized to you, of course, your business. Self-assignment default hours. So what happens in WorkOtter is sometimes I'll create a task and assign it to a generic role. Or I won't assign it to anyone. There's a way where people can then, who are on my team, self-assign to that particular task. And you can set the default hours because you might have a large pool of hours. Let's call it a thousand hours. And maybe by default 
you only want them to take 40 hours of it, leaving the rest of the time available to other team members. Because the default otherwise is it'll just take all the time and it just becomes kind of an administrative burden to have to go back in and fix that. So we recommend leaving it at 40. Auto populate weekly timesheets, we recommend leaving it at yes. System email, this might be turned off initially when you're first getting set up and we recommend that. Later when you're ready to start the emailing that goes with work order, you can turn it back on. Standard weekly hours is when you create a new person in work order, what number of hours constitutes 100% of their time? So if you're tracking administrative time in work order, you know, things like sick time, pay time off, uh, could be vacation time, or you don't perhaps you don't have administration time at all and you're not tracking meetings and things like that. So you might set this to 32 hours a week and that equals 100%. If you do have administrative time, then you'll probably want to keep it at 40 hours a week by default. Of course, on a person-by-person -person basis, you can change this as you see fit. Person edit lock flag field, we recommend you enabling this. This just blocks many of the setting features. So when people look at their own personal settings, it's highly restrictive. Grid default page size, this is the record set page size when you pull up a grid and work order. We recommend it 30 or less. 25 is a good number. Approval system. This is based on the time entry approval system and if you want single approval, meaning if a manager or a project manager approves the time, then the time is considered approved. Dual approval would be if a manager and the project manager both need to approve the time. It's rarely used. I would leave it at single approval. Time period lock behavior. This is if your company has a process or procedure for locking time, meaning perhaps at the end of the month you run reports for accounting, and after that point you can do a reconciliation later, but you don't want people going back and entering time before that cutoff date when the reports were set to finance is a good example of what I'm speaking of. And if you want to have that locking feature enabled, leave it to yes. If you're unsure, you can turn it off and always turn it back on later. Time approval is what by default is your time approval strategy. So manual approval means wait for someone to have their time approved and that's the default and we recommend it. Automatic approval means anyone who submits their time it's automatically approved and only by exception would you reject the time. We have additional features though where you can set it to manual approval and override it and make it automatic approval. For example, some of our clients have employees as automatic approval, but their contractors and folks like that have to have their time manually approved for the invoicing. It's just an example. So we recommend you leaving it as default. Now, in the people, in the person area, you can also set up a, an additional administration person number. This would be maybe an ID from an HR, payroll, or ERP system that you want to be able to tie to for reporting. If you're not sure, you can leave it off. Same, and we give you another ID as well. Again, if you're not sure, you can leave it off. The rest of these are by default, and we suggest you leaving them as is. When you're done, please don't forget to save your changes, as otherwise, if you leave the page, you'll lose them and you'll have to start over. But those are the global configuration settings that we recommend. There's some additional settings here too that you might take a look at within Work Order that we consider kind of part of those master settings. We'll be covering some of those in later videos. But with what you've done now, you're ready to move on to the second deliverable, which is the configuration population tool, which we will now cover in a series of videos after this one.